Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We are really, really pleased to welcome you here in, in our virtual reality. Uh, my name is Marla Orenstein, and I'm the director of the Natural Resources Center at the Canada West Foundation. In case you don't know who we are, we are a public policy think tank. We are independent and nonpartisan, and we provide practical solutions to the tough public policy challenges facing the West and facing Canada at home and on the global stage. So this webinar today that, that you have signed up for, this one on future fit hydrocarbons, has grown out of a project that was put together by the Energy Futures Lab, or EFL. In case you haven't heard of it, the EFL is the coalition of diverse innovators and leading organizations working to accelerate the transition to the energy system the future requires of us. It's actually quite an amazing organization. I urge you to check it out. And full disclosure, I am also an ambassador of the EFL, so I will promote it everywhere I go. One initiative that the EFL has taken up over the last couple of years is something called the Energy Futures Policy Collaborative, or EFPC. This collaborative brought together a, a bunch of different groups from across Canada and, and working in very diverse positions to examine how Alberta's hydrocarbon industry can be transformed to align with and compete in a net zero future. Um, so the, what you're seeing today in terms of the webinar really comes out of this. That EFPC uh, effort was headed by Karen Perla, uh, who has also been doing a lot of the work behind the scenes to help bring today's webinar to fruition. So Karen, thank you so much for everything that you've done here. Uh, we have three fantastic panelists here today to talk about what future fit hydrocarbons are and how government policy can help a future fit hydrocarbon industry succeed. So with that, I'm gonna ask the panelists to come on board here and uh, turn on their cameras. We have three really thoughtful, insightful, brainy panelists today uh, that I'm really pleased to welcome. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves so I don't you know, immediately cause your brain death by having to read some bios out loud. Let's start with John. John, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure, thanks, Marla. Um, hey, folks, my name is John McNally. I'm the Program Director for Clean and Resilient Growth at the Smart Prosperity Institute. So we are an environment economy think tank. Uh, we're national in scope, and we're based out of the University of Ottawa. And Smart Prosperity has been around since the late 2000s. Uh, and in large part, I think we focused a lot on environmental markets, a lot of pricing issues, externalities, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and in the last few years, we've started to think a lot more about some of the uh, operational, logistical, very real world technical questions that come with taking climate action and really focusing on positive environmental action that really does reap economic benefits. We were really excited to be a part of the Energy Futures Policy Collaborative. Um, I was able to, to join as a member of the collaborative and, and also as a strategic advisor. And uh, it was a fascinating process for us to, to, to get to kind of come in and think a lot about really important questions around the future of Canada's resources sector, sustainable finance, all sorts of public policy discussions that are really entertaining for a wonk like me. Um, so really happy to be here today. Fantastic. Thanks so much, John. Alicia, can you introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Alicia Planinchich. I'm an economist and manager of policy at the Business Council of Alberta. Um, one thing maybe just slightly differently from the other wonderful panelists is my world is um, looking at energy and climate, but also a little bit broader issues related to Alberta. Um, so what's really interesting about that is there are so much intersection with Alberta in particular of these broader issues from things like long-term unemployment, um, the province's challenging fiscal state that sort of overlaps with this climate and energy discussion. So that's kind of one perspective that I bring. Um, the other perspective that I bring that I'll share is I spent the first 30-ish years of my life in the U.S., so I come with a pretty strong, um, I guess, consumer perspective and hat on energy and affordability. Uh, so one of the most interesting things of coming into this role and to Canada and Alberta has been thinking so much more about the producer's perspective and supply, which I think adds just so much more complexity and nuance beyond the discussion. Um, and just it's fascinating to me over the last few years to be a part of the policy collaborative and also to see just the difference in um, both kind of political perspectives uh, between the US and Canada, but also policy and kind of uh, what's been put in place over the last few years. So um, yeah, happy to be here. Fantastic, thank you. I feel like a game show host. And now we go to our final panelists to see what's behind door number three. 
Kevin, take it away. Well, any panel with you, Marla, is, is about as much fun as the game show. So uh, good to see everyone. About uh, as unpredictable. <laughs> Kevin Krauser, it's CEO and co-founder of Avatar Innovations. Um, 25 year executive, I guess, in oil field services, uh, had the chance to work on a lot of major energy projects, uh, as well as bring a number of emerging technologies to market. Um, recognizing sort of the uniqueness of the energy system and how a new technology integrates with it. Uh, about 18 months ago, I started a corporate innovation company called Avatar Innovations. Um, think of us as like a venture studio for large cap energy companies to work on breakthrough technologies. So there's sort of three legs uh, to the stool of Avatar. Uh, the first is an ideation, leadership development, come up with ideas uh, that can be implemented inside the energy system. The reality is we can't electrify everything. The most rational solutions to the other half of the emissions problem are solutions that exist inside oil and gas, carbon capture, renewable fuels, uh, hydrogen, et cetera. Um, the best of those ideas um, where hundreds of, of emerging leaders in oil and gas work together on problems, industry sponsors the best of those technologies and ideas concepts. They get into the second leg of the stool at Avatar uh, where they get access a little bit of pre-seed capital, access to University of Calgary and state labs, go and try and build you know, proof of concept. And then the final leg of the stool is Avatar Ventures where we place early stage investments um, and try to de-risk early stage technologies by building them inside the industry with a customer in place. Um, so yeah, we've been around for about 18 months. Um, we've generated 30 uh, technologies sponsored by industry thus far. Um, we've built a 17,000 square foot energy transition center in downtown Calgary to house all of this um, and have a partnership in place with Elon Musk's foundation on his $100 million carbon removal XPRIZE and now have two technologies competing for the 100 million. Fantastic. So pretty exciting stuff here. Um, audience, you will see a couple of different buttons at the bottom of your screen. There's both a chat and a Q&A. Please feel free to use the chat anytime to talk among yourselves, provide comments, things that you want to say, but please use the Q&A function for questions that you might actually have for the panelists. We're going to spend about the next 40 minutes or so going through some questions that I have, and then we're going to turn to those questions. I won't necessarily see them if they're in chat. I will if they're in the Q&A button. So away we go. Um, I want to start with this question of what is a future fit hydrocarbon? John, you were part of this group assembled by the EFL to look at that question. I was there. I know how tough that question was even to resolve. Can you tell me what a future fit hydrocarbon is? What does that term mean? Happy to. Um, and I promise to give the 30 to 45 second version of the explanation. <laughs> um, so ultimately, <laughs> I, ultimately, I think what we landed on was future fit hydrocarbon can mean one of two things. And it sort of depends on which part of the phrase you want to pull on a little bit more. So the first is that uh, future fit hydrocarbons can represent a set of technology or economic opportunities that are really attractive for the province. Um, a lot of the gold stars that get talked about a lot, things like carbon capture, blue or green hydrogen, um, nuclear, uh, nuclear fusion, there's lots of different technology opportunities that exist in Alberta. And future fit hydrocarbons can be a phrase that refers to this suite of them and then thinks about what kind of policies, what kind of financing, what kind of technical solutions need to be put in place to support them. There is another way that you can refer to future fit hydrocarbons, which is you can think of a future fit hydrocarbon as literally any hydrocarbon that operates in the future. That is a very valid perspective to have. Uh, and in that case, part of what I think we'd want to think a lot more about when we're asking ourselves policy and financing infrastructure questions is where does the entire market need to go and shift in order to make sure that we're still aligned with these positive environmental and climate outcomes that we want to see? What are investors asking for? A whole bunch of different questions. Ultimately, I think the term probably encompasses a little bit of both. And so we have to kind of have both perspectives when we walk into the conversation. That, that's a, a good way of framing it. One thing that was always in my mind when we were having the conversations is who gets to decide? Who is the right to decide um, what is a future fit hydrocarbon? Is it something that the stakeholders of today should be dictating and saying, nope, if it's going to be future fit, it only has to fit within these categories? Or is it the, the customer of the future who is purchasing um, the, the hydrocarbon itself? I mean, if they're making the, per the purchase, they are deciding on the future fitness. 
Alicia, you are also um, part of those conversations. How does John's description fit with your idea of what future pet hydrocarbon means? So yeah, I would say like an another way to think about it instead of defining it is to ask the question of, you know, what are valuable ways that we can essentially repurpose our oil and gas, gas assets, um, whether that be, you know, the geography, infrastructure, our workforce skills, intellectual property in ways that drive emissions reduction. So what are valuable ways to do that? But the key word and the challenging word there is valuable because to your point, Marla, it's to whom and how is this changing? So I think the challenge with this word is that I think as a collaborative, we wanted this really explicit definition to say exactly what it was. And I think what we realized the more we had these conversations is that future fitness is something that's going to evolve. And what is future fit five years from now is different from what is future fit 10 years from now. So I think um, that was kind of the complexity with this term, but I think ultimately who is making those decisions is really the consumers and consumer demand as well as investors on their behalf. So um, yeah, just a couple of things that I would add there is um, a, very much an evolving definition. And I think the other thing with that is it highlights the risk of, we don't know for certain, right? What is future fit five years from now, 10 years from now, et cetera. Fantastic. Well, you know, I, I know that we've all been party to some fairly strident conversations about what the future of energy should look like. Kevin, is there space for hydrocarbons in the future? And how, how much do you think conventional fuels can actually be decarbonized? Well, that's a, a, that's a trillion dollar question, uh, I guess. Um, of course, uh, the reality is without getting into the sort of nuances of chemistry, uh, civilization is impossible to run without hydrocarbons. They exist naturally. It's the emissions that is, is the challenge with them. So everything from asphalt to plastics, whether those plastics are made from renewable sources or not, um, there's, you know, re the reality is, is there's going to be hydrocarbons for the foreseeable future. It's the emissions problem that I think people need to really tackle. And, you know, I look at it often from sort of a, a technology lens of how we're going to get there. You know, I often say the energy transition is going to be, you know, messy, complicated and hard um, in the sense that, you know, we're, we're talking about some pretty funda foundational changes with a huge amount of capital. How do we carve out lanes to win in this future is, you know, what I think about very frequently. And I really see, you know, four strategies unfolding, depending upon the, the asset base, somebody, you know, a, 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 an energy producer is working with. And, you know, the first strategy is, okay, we're just going to consolidate its cost and we're going to get uh, hydrocarbon out of the ground at the cheapest possible barrel. And that will build in resilience into the business strategy such that they are in a position to compete in a low price environment, in a high price environment. And that's really the strategy I'd say the juniors are, are rolling out. Um, you've got a second strategy, you know, that I think, you know, probably exemplified by a lot of the leadership in Canada, um, especially with the leaders like Suncor and, and Synovus, is that they're going to remain, you know, primarily an oil producer but they're also going to invest in the emissions reductions technologies um, that are going to sort of future fit those hydrocarbons if you want. So they're investing in the renewable fuels, the carbon captures, whatnot. Then, you know, the super majors are really unfolding this sort of, we're, we're a transitioning energy company. Um, you know, this is the shells and the totals. We're um, going to invest, you know, we're going to, you know, hold our production, you know, at limits, and then we're going to invest in wind and solar and all these different things. And then the third, the final piece is, you know, we're, we're off fossil fuels or we're, you know, off hydrocarbons and that's your Orsteds in Europe. Um, I think there's a compelling shareholder value capture thesis for each of those strategies. But from a Canadian lens and a Canadian perspective, I think the second strategy is going to be the one that wins for the majority of the Canadian players in the sense of if we can- When is which one was the second one of the four? Oh, the, the, we're going to remain a, a low cost producer while we invest in emissions reduction technologies. Mm -hmm. Take solar and wind projects, the capital multiples, the risk return pro profiles are fundamentally different than what an investor expects from uh, a producer, which is why the shells in the total stock performance hasn't been anywhere close to uh, what Synovus has been. Um, and so that the reason I think I want to circle in on that is we have in Canada just taken the oil sands and over the past 
decade. You know, they're built on this assumption of they were profitable at $70 oil. You've got leading facilities now like Christina Lake with Synovus that's, you know, lift cost is $8 a barrel. That competes against the Saudis. There's no production in the Permian that can compete on $8 a barrel. What we have to do now is get the carbon under control. And so that is by definition going to become a future fit, fit hydrocarbon. And so what we need to be thinking about is how do we invest in these technologies that are going to reduce emissions while maximizing the economic gain mm -hmm. uh, that we have. And that's, that's the exciting work that I'd say is happening in Canada's energy industry right now. That, that's great. And, and, and some of what you say are themes that I'm going to return to a little bit later in terms of how do we induce that investment and in exactly what you're talking about. Um, before we get to that, though, I want to return to the question of, of what constitutes a future fit hydrocarbon industry. And John, you in particular did a lot of work during this the CFPC project, what the elements are that need to be in place for, for Alberta's hydrocarbon industry to be considered future fit. Obviously, we're leaping right towards the decarbonization one, and that's going to be a big part of it. But, but what's the full picture? Can you tell me about that? Sure. Um, so just to build on some of the points that I think the, the previous panelists have made, there are three major people who effectively get to decide what the energy system of the future is. One is consumers and the choices that we make within the market. The other is investors who largely have the capital to be able to do things like dictate terms where the money goes and the kinds of projects they want to build. But the third one is governments. All, no government is purely agnostic to the kinds of energy sources that get used within their countries. And the reasons for that is because they have to set things like technology and performance standards, they have to build out associated infrastructure, what gets invested in and what doesn't is a big factor in what other kinds of projects get built. And ultimately governments are um, massive decision makers when it comes to your energy systems, especially if we're thinking about something like the electricity system in Canada, where we have a host of vertically integrated utilities. Um, so I think we have a tendency uh, in some of these debates to think about public policy as this thing that needs to figure out what consumers and investors want to do, when as much as anything else, it's about better understanding how the three groups can work together to achieve the objectives of the jurisdiction itself. And that, I think, is largely what we identified when we started thinking about what future fitness meant, is that what we, if we want to understand largely the direction that folks seem to be shifting in, what kinds of definitions they're using, what kind of projects are getting money in, and, and which ones aren't, what are the new standards that are being put forward? You have to look at all three. Um, and uh, we ended up identifying three big priorities that govern that the, the the term decision makers, which is investors and governments and markets, are really driving towards. Which is there's basically three things that people care about when they're thinking about future fitness. One is alignment with a net zero target. If you have a net zero target in your company, or perhaps more preferably in your region, in your jurisdiction, province, country, whatever it happens to be, um, investors have a sense of certainty that you're going to be more resilient in terms of capital moving in every which direction. And it also gives you a little bit more policy certainty that this is the direction that the country's heading. We know this investment is going to be safer, even if we decide to put it in at a higher environmental standard than otherwise might be rewarded in the market today. Because as Alicia stressed, it's five years, 10 years, 15 years, what does future fitness mean? Most of these capital intensive industries think in terms of decades. Um, the second piece is we wanna think a lot about not only net zero alignment, but alignment with science-based scenarios for what uh, climate sort of real and ambitious climate action looks like in this case. Um, there are a lot of infrastructure projects that may fare fairly well when put up against certain scenarios, but some of the really ambitious decarbonization people pieces, all of a sudden these assets start to look really stranded by 2040 or 2045. And if you're talking about something with a payback period of a 20 to 25 year timeline, it's 2022. Um, we have to really start to think about these horizons as now being within the lifespan of the assets that we build. And the third piece that was really important for us was infrastructure decisions. Investors really care about the infrastructure for energy and technology that you have in a particular region because it's an indication of two things. Number one, the level of government commitment to actually supporting the growth of this particular industry or private sector commitment in this case. It's also a big indicator of know-how. You know, are, are folks serious about this? Are you going to have the infrastructure you need to be able to advance this opportunity? But the other thing it sends a clear signal about is like, is this, is this the kind of commitment that we can realistically think we're going to get support on if we want to take our investment and build it into being a bit more of an industry in that particular region, right? Which is ultimately a big part of where growth comes from. Um, and although on a lot of these measures, major projects have, have, we've noticed capital has poured really heavily in the directions of a lot of these areas. They're what we see in 
a lot of transition taxonomies, a lot of different investment standards that have been put out by multilateral groups, a host of different international bodies. A lot of the banks have thought really seriously about these, as well as a lot of government policies have started to re really seriously think about. If we, if we don't totally know where the market's going, and we're counting on a lot of the breakthrough technologies that, uh, that I know that Kevin works on every day, and, and we don't totally know what those are going to be, what minimum standard does everyone need to meet, and how can we ensure we shift in that direction? A question that I'll throw out to whichever of the three of you wants to answer first, is a future fit hydrocarbon industry an economically viable hydrocarbon industry? Yes, uh, you know, it depends, it depends what you, you say, you know, like, right now, let's take renewable natural gas, um, you know, basically the, you know, you take biomass, um, use some sort of chemical process or biological process to produce renewable natural gas in the sense that it takes the carbon in the current carbon system, not subsurface, and then recycles it in a new way to produce highly, you know, fungible hydrocarbon in it. Um, you know, right now you've got companies out issuing 10 to 20 year contracts for projects that can deliver at a strike price for renewable natural gas. Um, you know, and then you factor in carbon intensity credits into that, you factor in $9 gas at Henry Hub, um, these projects are starting to look highly, highly material. Um, and so there is ways of moving the technology dial to create a highly um, effective, and, and who's out with these, with these, you know, standing strike price contracts for renewable natural gas projects? Um, it's the midstreamers, um, it's Enbridge, it's TransCanada, it's, you know, uh, Ford is BC. So, I think it's a little bit of a, a, a presumption to say, what are we defining as actually a hydrocarbon? We need it for all of these usage. How are we actually gonna make it? There's now renewable liquid, liquid fuels, sustainable aviation fuels. Um, this is the expertise the oil and gas industry has, if you will, and they're all pivoting in this direction in, in some regards. And you know, not only do we need some breakthrough technologies that I think will continuously come, we need mechanisms of funding and financing those what I'll you know, happy to elaborate on those, but um, the long and short answer is, um, if you look at energy, any energy transition, um, the simplest, cheapest, and fastest way of accomplishing it is to use the existing energy infrastructure that exists in some new way. The slowest, most complicated, and most expensive way of doing it is to go and reinvent some whole brand new uh, energy system. Um, you know the, the light bulb thread that's on every single light bulb that you can take from one part and plug it in basically anywhere else? Mm -hmm. um, this is an analysis from Peter Trzakian, but that light bulb thread is actually, it's called the Edison number one. It comes from a whale oil lamp. So what Thomas Edison realized was that everyone already had whale oil lamps in their houses, and it was far easier to just run an electric filament through the whale oil lamp than to come up with some whole new system. So let's look at this. This energy transition, you know, McKin the IEA is saying this is going to be, you know, two trillion dollars a year of capital. Uh, McKinsey just came out and said it's going to cost 180 trillion of dollars of capital by 2050. This is a staggering amount of capital we're talking about. How do we do it as simple as, as we can? And if you take that light bulb example, it's going to be repurposing pipelines. It's going to be looking at wells in new ways. It's going to be looking at petrochemical facilities in new ways. So yes, it's it you know it, we have to create the structures that are going to make it economic, and I mo a lot of this already is there. Yeah, that's I, great. Go ahead, John. One, one thing that I just want to add to that, um, and it seems like I'm the definitions guy on the panel, which I love for me. Um, I think uh, I I think when you ask the question about economic viability, the only piece I want to add is it also promises to not only be economically viable for the technology solutions, but largely probably for Alberta. Um, and the reason for that is that, uh, like Kevin stressed, the things that tend to succeed best in a lot of these environments are uh, take the solutions that we're already really, really good at and figure out creative ways to repurpose them. There's a lot of innovation literature that points to that as well, which is basically the things we're already good at are largely going to be the things we're good at moving forward. Alberta's really good at making oil and gas. Um, there's a lot of expertise. There's a lot of know-how, tons of knowledge on how to do everything from put together project financing deals to try and understand uh, the standards that infrastructure needs to get built to for a lot of the existing stuff, thinking about repurposing. There's a strong petro sector, thousands of skilled workers, um, a ton of capital in the space. There is a lot of really, really solid potential to think about how to take uh, great ideas and repurpose them for, for areas that can generate a lot of wealth into the future. Um, and I think uh, the question of economic viability, like 
we can run as many models as we want. At the end of the day, we're just largely forecasting numbers into the future. Um, but if you're going to bet on something that has a high degree of potential, Alberta scores pretty well on a lot of the metrics that would matter. Fantastic. I think that's a really nice, nice positive message as well, I, I, which I think is going to be refreshing to a lot of people as there's often a lot of negativity and it just can't be done um, messaging out there already. Uh, Kevin, you had something you wanted to add there? Yeah, I just want to make a, a, a finer point on what John was saying is, is the opportunity here is actually for the oil and gas industry to now come out as the heroes. We have a once in a generational opportunity now um, with you know, essentially strong commodity prices for the foreseeable future in both a carbon constrained world and an investment constrained world that is looking at making long term investments that are uncertain right now where we have this, you know, incredible basin uh, that can produce oil. Now, if we can figure out a way to use the tremendous cash flow that's going to be generated from this industry to invest in the technologies the future of the world requires and wants, this is a this is a win win scenario for for Alberta, and I think it's beyond just the project management and expertise on molecules like renewable gas and hydrogen. Um, it's also on the electrification side. Like, um, do you guys know who invented the lithium ion battery? Not a clue. Exxon Mobil. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's really 30, 40, interesting. 30, 40 years ago, there is so much like deep technology that's inside of these organizations and we are in such a unique position to to yeah. win and we just have to be looking at this not through the hyper polarized lens that we have been looking at it but through the lens of how do we how do we win at this yeah i i, I had queued up a, a question for alicia here but i'm going to hold on that because kevin you just batted this into a question i wanted to ask a little later which is that you work with the innovators at, at avatar you work with the innovators in the oil and gas space so you have access to seeing behind the curtain of the future in a way that most of us don't so in your opinion are we on pace with, with developing the clean tech that we actually need to support a future uh, energy system that's decarbonized sustainable and also affordable who do who's we would you say we <laughs> is that the industry is that canada is that western canada well i'm gonna i'm gonna let you just choose how you want to answer that one because i i've also been on panels with you before and, and i know what some of your soapboxes are so you uh you go ahead and answer that in your favorite way um by and large i'd say from a industry perspective it has picked up to a pace that i have never seen before in my life um where the we i think falls short is actually canada um, you know, we had a four year start on the Americans on, you know, basically wrapping our head around decarbonized, the de decarbonization of the energy sector, methane emissions, the Americans are out of the gate and the Americans are out of the gate strong. And, um, the big gap that I see is the lack of risk capital in Canada versus the availability of risk capital that is in the U S I can name you three incredible breakthrough technologies that have been generated in Canada in the last month alone that have relocated to the United States because they can't get a check written for an early stage investment in Canada, but they can get it done in Silicon Valley in Houston um, and we're, we're losing talent. That is, that is the, the big piece of the puzzle that concerns me. I'm so why can't we get the checks written here? I mean, I, kn I know you and I have had conversations before about, for example, Evoke Innovations in BC and the extent to which they're they're funding clean tech, but not in Alberta. What's going on? So yeah, just to put a finer tip on that. So Evoke Innovations, sort of Canada's premier venture capital, clean, clean tech energy transition uh, venture capital fund just raised a $300 million USD fund for investing in exactly this backed by Suncor and Snovus, RBC, CPVIB, all the smart money. And of the thousand deals they've done preliminary due diligence on, zero are from Alberta. And so that speaks to a systemic issue of an absence of risk capital. Now, some of that we can attract here and we need to get Calgary um, uh, back on the venture capital roadshow, if you will. But the other piece of the puzzle is too, is Canada is blessed with tremendous amounts of non-dilutive grants that are not available in the US. The challenge with that is that instead of curating a generation of entrepreneurs, we have created a generation of some you know, professional application fillers. And then the good ones can't get the check, so they go to the United States. So 
what we need to do is we need to harness the, there used to be this incredible success record of entrepreneurship in Canada's oil and gas sector. We just called them juniors. Mm -hmm. And how do we reinvite, ignite and reinvent that sense of entrepreneurship um, to build out these technologies of the future? And that's, I think, how we're going to, how we're going to win at it. So, um, you know, by and large, I think we're moving in the right direction, but now is not the time to crack the champagne. Um, would be my point. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Alicia, I, I do want to go back to this question I had for, for you, because I know two things that you're really concerned about are energy affordability and energy security. And these have these, I mean, these are issues that have really come to the fore over the last year, particularly with the war from Russia and the global energy supply uh, changes that have resulted. What are your thoughts around how the concept of future fitness might change when we start adding energy security and affordability issues into the mix? Yeah, so I mean, it's such an obvious thing to say, I think, but it's something we've forgotten a little bit with time is that energy affordability really matters. And expensive energy is really a true hardship for people around the globe, right? In the same way that if we were to lower the incomes of everyone around the world, there's not really a good substitute for energy, right? You can't heat your home in a different way. You can't get into work a different way. Um, so I think this has kind of reset our priorities, right? Whereas before it was kind of easy to forget about these pieces of affordability and security and just think solely in terms of emissions as we think about the transition. Whereas now we're kind of forced to think more broadly across this criteria set of how do we support all of these together. And I think another important thing, again, I'll pull a little bit from the US is this is important, not just economically from a hardship perspective, but also politically, as far as having support for an energy transition, you're gonna very quickly lose that as energy becomes more expensive to consumers. And I will say kind of my assessment, a little bit of the misleadingly named Inflation Reduction Act in the US, um, which of course at the heart of it is a lot of climate and energy policy. You know, I think a lot of the reason that you're seeing more um, carrots than sticks is because um, of the cost to consumers and wanting to uh, support that affordability and security piece. Um, I will say, I think one thing that we actually got right in our collaborative is we did have this piece front and center in our criteria, that economic viability. So I think it's just how do we apply that same broader criteria to the energy transition overall and not just for future fit hydrocarbons because I think this really expands um, and brings a big role for hydrocarbons to fill that space to ensure both affordability and security both now and also for years to come. Well, so this, this leads right into that question of, um, of, of the costs. Transition's expensive. In your opinion, Alicia, who should be on the hook for the costs of that? So yeah, tough question. I think the first way that I think about this is kind of what, what actually needs to happen to um, in order to support an energy transition and to support future pit hydrocarbons. And I think the biggest thing and what uh, Kevin was getting out at a little bit there is um, basically we, we need to see speed and scale far beyond what we've currently seen to hit those targets and also to compete with, you know, increasingly the U.S. and other jurisdictions that are going really big in this space. So I think a couple of things that need to happen are not so much about money and are a little bit more about policy. So, and this has kind of come up from the other panelists as well. Um, certainly one of them is just uh, policy certainty. I think it's felt like for uh, many of our members and businesses overall, just a bit of a policy jungle out there of, you know, different, different targets, adding different uh, uh, restrictions or initiatives specific to certain industries, like I'm sure we'll talk later about the oil and gas cap in particular, and it's just this moving target. And so we have to recognize that businesses, just like governments, just like people, we have constraints to John's point earlier, you know, executives might think that some a certain project is a great idea and has potential, but if they can't get their investors on board, they can't get capital, it doesn't matter ultimately. So I think greater policy certainty um, is certainly one big piece that we need. Um, another is increasing uh, or decreasing rather the uh, length of time for regulatory approvals. So I apologize if you've heard this statistic before, but I think it's such an important one is that Canada ranks next to last on the length of time for approval for a construction project. 
uh, about triple the length of time of the US, 250 days. And so again, as we think about, you know, those 2030 targets, it's like the projects that we're doing now is really what's going to impact whether or not we get there, not the projects that come into place three years from now. So a couple of big things from a policy perspective that's not really cost, but I think the third one, and this is something both Kevin and John have mentioned a little bit, is how do we actually de-risk more of those projects to get more projects that are potential into the green. And so I think that's where there's a really good kind of public argument for public support and dollars of these public private partnerships where government can really help to tip more of those projects um, to give them a green light, which I think is ultimately a benefit to Albertans and to Canadians overall. So I think that's really the space where um, we've seen kind of looking at other jurisdictions as far as who's really done well in this space, you have to have that role of public dollars too. And I think the U.S. in just this last week has been a really good example of going big in that space. Um, absolutely. Um, just before I go on to this next point, I want to remind everybody there's been some fantastic uh, comments coming through chat. Uh, I urge you also to populate our Q&A so that when we, when we turn to these questions, uh, we have some available that we can um, ask the panelists. John, Alicia kind of threw the ball directly to you on that in, in, in talking about the area of government policy. I know this is something that you're always thinking about at Smart Prosperity, just as we are at the Canada West Foundation. So I'm going to give you a kind of a double barrel question on this one. First, what's the right policy role for government to help a future fit hydrocarbon industry succeed? And second, how, you'll probably answer this with it, but how specifically can government use policy to incentivize investment in decarbonization and the other elements that that comprise future fitness. Oh, I like that question. Yeah, um, nice open lane for you there. <laughs> it's good. I got, I got a lot to work with. Okay, um, so I'll start off with I think the descriptive speech. So policy can effectively do three things. Um, one is it can add clarity. The second is it can add urgency, and the third is it can add um, sweeteners and momentum. Um, it can do more than this in practice, but for the case of this discussion, I think this is a useful framework. So when we talk about adding clarity, a large part of what I think about uh, is things like clarifying the technical standards that things need to be built to in order for projects to get approved on the timelines that they're supposed to. Um, right now, a large part of the investor uncertainty that exists in a lot of capital intensive sectors, and this is seen at really high degrees in clean tech, as well as a bunch of other natural resource spaces, um, is that there often isn't a ton of certainty as to what specific environmental or technology or performance standards a facility actually needs to be built to, um, or a project needs to be built to, or something needs to be advanced to, for it to smooth through the regulatory approvals process and be fine 5, 10, 15 years down the line. If governments can add clarity as to where it is that they actually want to set direction and they can stick to that, sets of, that, that set of direction, it's going to do a very, very significant thing to help add some certainty to investors who are looking to advance some of these core projects, which is part of what tools like legislation that cements targets and some of the contracts that the federal government has talked about that help sort of cement carbon prices into the future are aiming to do. They're aiming to add some certainty through policy measures that can help us really add clarity for the scope of the future. The second is urgency. Um, and what I mean by urgency is that governments can help uh, governments can help sort of define the, the playing fields for the market a little bit more to try and understand in what direction they want the, the, the game to move in. So I talked a lot earlier about net zero standards. That's a great example of a government adding some urgency if it finds a way to make decreasing um, emissions reduction targets over time, can create things like carbon prices, performance standards that send these clear signals to the market. No, you actually have to act today. And it's not just that there's incentives and sweeteners on the table to be able to do it, but you're essentially helping push the entire market in a given direction, which is really useful when we're thinking about meeting climate targets, as I think the other panelists have stressed repeatedly, this is a big set of changes that we're talking about here. It's monumental. And we're kind of going to need everything. We're going to need the lines of the playing field to be super clear. And we're going to need everyone to have a collective agreement on the sense of urgency that we really need to advance momentum with. But when we're talking about capital intensive sectors, um, just wanting one to appear often isn't enough to actually drive the investment into the space. Uh, it's as, as the phrase I think I use sometimes is it's hard to manifest growth. So what we need to do is think a lot about how we can make it uh, sweeter 
I mean, we can add some sweeteners rather to help drive capital into some of these really big capital intensive sectors. Um, as Alicia mentioned, that is a large part of what the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States aimed to do, um, is it put forward a lot of different sweeteners for consumer and production side, including a host of things like manufacturing tax credits that we've written a lot about that aim to kind of um, get these industries prepared to kind of really start to accelerate growth at some of the scale and pace needed. Um, I think that, uh, uh, I think that over time, it's there's a lot of modeling that shows it will reduce energy costs by the time that the tax credits sort of formally roll out, get deployed, all the energy consumer things do end up rolling out, which I think the deadlines I've seen for that modeling are 2030 or 2035. Um, but the final piece I want to note is how can you figure out how to drive finance into these spaces? So all of those are super valuable, right? Make it lower cost to do it through incentives, add some urgency so that folks really start to see that this is a priority and add some clarity so that investors stop sort of investors don't end the project decisions at the giant question mark about what exactly is going to be happening here in five years. But we can also think about whether or not the government wants to act as more of a partner or just someone who draws the lines in the playing field, both of which are acceptable roles. Oftentimes, I think when we think about government partnerships, the phrase that comes to mind is something like industrial policy or industrial strategy, which is that government thinks about the list of technologies it really wants to advance and finds ways to advance them. Um, Industrial policy and industrial strategy have a have a, a historic and maybe global reputation of perhaps not being all out of effect. Um, and there is lots of research that's been done in recent years to actually show that there are ways to do it that can really um, that really can support industry growth if government walks in more as a partner. Uh, in large part, the way that I like to think about industrial policy or strategy is that. One size fits all policy by definition doesn't really fit any given region individually because we recognize that Alberta is different than Ontario than Quebec than BC, right? That, that makes sense. So industrial strategy and policy are about opening up the option set that exists so we can try and design policy solutions that work better for the opportunities that exist in a particular region. And it's also about government making choices. Um, which is largely, I think, a lot of what we have to do if we do want to find ways to maintain momentum. We are going to need to make some choices. We're going to need to decide what's going to work for us and what isn't. And having governments send clear commitments and market signals to that can help add the urgency, uh, really help reduce the risk that comes from investors being uncertain about these things by showing that there is some there's some action in the market and governments really do believe in these things. Um, and it can add a fair bit of clarity as to which opportunities that the country has decided it really wants to double down on. Kevin, can can you speak at all to the, sort of the back half of what John was talking about there about the, the the need for and the ways the government can use policy to drive investment towards where it's needed? Mm -hmm. and well, I did want to jump on the first part because I think there's a fourth one you're, you're, you could add to your mix is, or maybe it's just what happens when those three fail is basically just confidence, right? As soon as you derail confidence from investors to do big projects, we're, we're, we're done. Um, we missed the boat and, and, and we've got a pretty good track record of some of that in Canada too. And I'd say we're risking it right now where you've got, um, you know, essentially the largest exporter of all of Canada ready to do perhaps the largest capital spend on carbon capture in the oil and gas industry's history. And you've got the leading conservative candidate saying he's going to derail the economics of those projects in the next election. So now they're, you know, looking, well, why am I going to invest in this um, if I don't generate a return? The way to think about how corporations are going to make investment decisions is, is really simple. They have a suite of options. If they spend a dollar today, they want to know they have more than a dollar tomorrow. Um, so they're not going to spend a dollar on carbon capture and any other initiatives because unless, unless they can demonstrate that it does that. And so how could we create mechanisms to incentivize the industry and the incumbent industry that to to work on these types of solutions the reality is the easiest way to probably get that project done would be for the feds and the province to pony up together and put in half the capital and we'd get it done politically un unacceptable uh to be able to do it that way so now we're coming up with less efficient economic means of sort of incentivizing groups to be able to um to do that you know high level in notionally um we have to be start start making some of these big bets, and the goal of the government is going to have to be to de-risk them, such that we can ensure that an investment opportunity in Canada is akin to an investment opportunity elsewhere in the world, and the whole world is moving in this decarbonization uh, direction. 
So I'm certainly not a public policy expert um, and none of the politicians I talk to ever listen to me. So I'm gonna steer clear of, uh, of, of, of too prescriptive of, of measures, but I would encourage, and I do, you know, to think about how, how do we incentivize the industry so that they can start spending on these projects. Um, Western Canada is, is blessed with this, you know, highly advantageous sedimentary basin for carbon storage one of the best in the world. And if you look at sort of, you know, through history, where industry would prop up, it would always around where resources were available. You know, with the, the water mill on rivers um, became sort of hubs of activity. And so do are, are we in a unique position now to start clustering a lot of heavy industry in this pristine basin um, because we can incentivize a world leading carbon capture and sequestration issue. And I don't think the province can get off on this either. You know, we're what, a year out since the oil sands people have announced uh, their intention to do this? And where are we at on pore space in the province? So like, you know, I don't think this is a partisan issue. I think this is an ability of Canada navigating a regulatory structure that this is kind of where, where we're going um, and let the markets work. You know, I look at Germany. Uh, recently, they just announced, um, you know, dealing with astronomical energy prices, uncertain how they're going to heat themselves in, in the winter this year. They've just issued a new regulatory system where any new energy project has a six month regulatory approval process. Imagine if we did that in Canada. We're saying now we're gonna decrease emissions by 42% in seven and a half years. And it takes six years to get a permit. Like seriously, like, <laughs> like we have to, you know, how do we get this? How do, how do we create enough of a narrative as, as Canada that perhaps the most Canadian solution that we want to be able to get there and then these politicians trying to score cheap political points um, can actually start delivering what Canadians and industry wants. want. This is, this is great. I, I've got one more uh, question that I definitely want to ask you before I go to the Q&A there. And Alicia, I'll start with you with, with the, as the answer, but guys, feel free to jump on. It has to do with what, what we are likely to see as the effects of the IRA, the, the new um, Inflation Reduction Act, misnamed, as Alicia pointed out, uh, in the U.S., I mean, it's come with huge amounts of money. What is it like over three hundred and fifty billion dollars being invested towards a uh, clean energy pivot? Is this something that's going to benefit Canada because we'll sort of get the trickle down benefit of seeing cost curves decline on a lot of technologies, or is this something that is going to push out our own clean tech innovators and actually cause hardships for us? Or maybe it's a bit of both, or something else entirely. What does it mean for Canada? Alicia, take it away. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree that it's a bit of both. I think as the other panelists have already kind of mentioned, it makes it a really uh, attractive investment place for investment, uh, more so than Canada. So I think in one sense, to me, it's a bit of a wake up call of just kind of the amount of dollars that are being spent to this end when you look at the US uh, compared with Canada. So I think definitely a challenge and definitely a wake up call. But I think the second piece is there is also um, a potential benefit, especially when it comes to uh, critical minerals opportunities. So one of our, the building blocks, um, kind of the biggest potential opportunities that are sort of already underway in Alberta that we kind of identified as a part of the policy collaborative. Um, one of them was around lithium and um, materials for batteries. And so I think, you know, that's just one example where because of how the um, electric vehicle subsidy, the new one put out as a part of this act is defined, um, it needs to be uh, bringing in inputs from North America. So luckily for Canada, this is not uh, US only, it is for all of North America, which really provides some space for uh, Alberta specifically and Canada overall to really lean into these opportunities for Im important inputs in, um, in this space. So I think really big opportunities, but definitely a wake up call is kind of how I would think about it. But curious to hear what uh, John and Kevin have to say as well. John or Kevin, either of you have any thoughts on what the implications are for, for the clean tech in industry in Canada? Oh, Kevin, you should go first and then I'll, I'll go next. <laughs> um, neither of you have anything to say. It's like pulling teeth. It's terrible. <laughs> I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna give John the shot on that one. But you know, generally speaking, I think there's advantages in the sense that it creates, it brings the US and its tremendous amount of um, industrial might and horsepower and buying power 
um, to the table to increase the market around clean technology. So I think it's it's probably a, a sort of net win. The challenge and the dynamic, again, is if Canada doesn't recognize these sort of underlying structural issues of an absence of risk capital and the tendencies to use only sticks on, um, on clean tech and not carrots, because that was all those $369 billion of the carrots. Uh, whereas we've, we're still dealing with sticks here. You know, that is, if, 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 it, if it creates, it creates a wake up call in Canada to look at the structural issues, then we can capitalize on the four years of Head Start we've had the Americans and work in, in life. Um, just to quickly add to that, I think uh, it's good for us and it's bad for us, but the bad for us has a giant asterisk next to it because it really depends how we play it. Um, good for us in the sense that the United States starting to finally take climate change seriously at a federal level is an unmitigated good for this thing that Canada has decided it wants to do and care about. And the massive investment that they're making will lower costs for technologies for a lot of the households and consumers that, that, that really do want to advance these things and put them forward. Um, and uh, Canada also has decided to lead in this space fairly aggressively. And this helps create a lot of markets for Canadian technology if we do want to export it to the United States, which has historically been our largest export market. So it's good for us on all of those fronts. Um, the challenge for us that I think it creates is we now, I think, have had a lead for a while, but the United States remains an economy that is so much bigger than Canada's um, that it just has an ability to do things and innovate at a historic rate, as we've seen for decades upon decades in the US every time most new technologies arise. Um, the challenge that this creates is that there's now a lot more competition in the space, and Canada is, uh, Canada is a smaller player than the US. Canada is a smaller player than a few of the countries that, that are now really taking this seriously, um, which includes China. And we are going to need to navigate which spaces and areas that we are going to succeed in if it turns out that some countries who are a lot bigger and have a lot more spending power decide that they really want to own a particular space. Mm -hmm. And that comes back, I think, to Alicia's, um, the, the point that Alicia raised about critical mineral supply chains is a potential example of that, right? Maybe it turns out that Canada really does break into the space. It does become a big Canadian industry. Um, but it's unlikely that we own every clean tech space that we want to play in. So those areas that we decide to carve out niches in this big, big new global market in are largely what's going to define our future prosperity as we make this energy transition. And it's really important that we think about the way that we fit into the broader world, um, which is now a, a bigger consideration than, than I think we've had in the past, because it's becoming clear that the really big players are seeing this as the market opportunity that it is. So this loops back to the point that you brought up before, and also a question from Richard Lemaire, and, and having to do with the times that it takes for regulatory approvals. And once we you know, decide that we want to be a, a, a big player in a specific space, getting in there in a timely way. So Richard asks, regarding slow regulatory approvals, where does the delay occur? Is government slow to approve? Or is industry not aware of the specific requirements required for approval? And more broadly, how do you balance due diligence with expediting approvals? Which is a really interesting question. Anybody want to take that? That sounds like an Alicia question, but I'm happy to give my two cents. <laughs> no, go ahead, Kevin. Um, I'd say um, first and foremost is overlap and uncertainty, right? Um, you know, the first is there's far too many bodies uh, with regulatory input into large project development. That, that's the easiest, simplest one. It shouldn't overcome uh, due diligence process to be able to do that. We need to be able to streamline this. Um, the second is, is political interference. Um, you, know, uh, you know, now we have an environmental regulatory assessment process where there's an opportunity for anyone to sort of call national intervention status and have to run our way up to uh, an elected minister, not a bureaucrat. And so there's the risk of sort of political interference there. And then, yeah, thirdly, corporations don't know which, which regulations to go because we have a needlessly complex regulatory process. So to balance the kind of due diligence aspects, um, okay, let's come up with a clear standard on emissions. Let's come up with a clear standard on indigenous engagement. Let's come up with a clear standard on water management, um, public input, and then go, you know, here's the rig fences. Let's, 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 let's go. I don't know. That would, that would be my answer to that, but, um, I'd be really interested in John and Alicia's thoughts on that too. 
I think Kevin nicely summed up a lot of the points I, I would make. Um, the other point I think I'll add is this. Um, there, in a number of the uh, councils, the, the federal government seems to organize a, an economic or business council once every eight months. Uh, but one of the ones that I think was put together back in 2017, 2018, 2019, identified that the single one of the single biggest challenges that the country faces outside of the lack of risk capital is just a massive amount of regulatory uncertainty. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily help that political campaigns largely run on undoing the thing that the last person just went ahead and did. Um, so you end up in this state where investors are constantly, with every election, asking themselves big questions around what standard they're actually supposed to meet for any of these respective projects, which gets increasingly in the way of the overlapping jurisdictions. I'm going to take my moderator's privilege to, to leap in with an opinion on, on this particular question, because it is something that, that I, I do think a lot about. And I, th I think there, there's two elements to it. One is one is procedural and one is evolutionary. And certainly in terms of the process, things could be made way more efficient. If we decided that, that this was a priority, we can put more resources on, we can get things through a little bit faster. But the part that we're still grappling with as a country, I think, has to do with procedural fairness to a number of groups that weren't always listened to, even though they were impacted by different types of projects. And we are, I, I think, still struggling with what the right balance is to make sure that those inputs can be fairly heard, um, but in a way that doesn't require any given um, application to do like nine PhD theses worth of um, data dive that nobody's ever going to read because that's the process. So I, I I really think that there needs to be a process change in terms of what the questions are that's asked. Um, what are the meaningful questions to be getting at in terms of when you're reviewing some sort of an application? So I, I could go on with that one for another hour or two, but, but we'll leave that because we have a couple more questions here. Um, somebody asked at the very beginning a very pro provocative question. I think we're going to make this th the last question just due to time. Do the panelists have a comment on the UN Secretary's comments on the record profits of oil and gas uh, from the energy crisis? Uh, should governments be introducing a windfall tax to oil and gas companies and use this to fund the transition to job retraining and funding carbon capture technologies? In other words, they're saying that oil and gas is making record profits. Should we be reaching in and taking some of those and saying you're putting more on the table for this? Oh, who wants to go first to this answer? <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I love this question. Um, so one thing I think that is, is super important to keep in mind is context and kind of the longer time period kind of going into the pandemic. So, you know, if you think about those last five or so years prior to the pandemic, we have to remember that uh, these same businesses were in a very, very constrained uh, fiscal state. They were taking on a lot of debt. They were very challenged as far as prices in the market. Um, so as far as what uh, investors are looking for, uh, they're not, you know, very excited about spending those, spending that money that they're finally bringing in on, on capital um, investment. So I think the, the challenge with now all of a sudden government coming in and scooping that money out is all that capital that, you know, that does still exist in those markets is just going to essentially run away would be um, kind of how I think about that. That's great. I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to just close with a brief. Can I just do one to say sentence something first? response Please. to that is it, it does not, not neither of what anybody wants. It neither lowers the cost of energy. It actually probably increases it. And then it doesn't invest in the energy transition to decarbonize in the long term. So like it's a lose-lose proposition on whatever area you're trying to stand on, um, despite the fact it might feel good. Fantastic. So a, a last thought from either of you, relatively brief, on future fit hydrocarbons in Canada and how can Canada win in the energy transition? Uh, John, let's start with you. Um, sure. I think the first thing Canada needs to do is figure out what winning looks like for Canada um, and try and really understand what it is that succeeding in this new world looks like for the country. That's a question that is likely going to differ region to region. So it's going to need to encompass a few different visions for what success entails. And then the country needs to largely figure out how exactly it wants to succeed in that environment. I think it comes back to the original definition I was mentioning, which is if success looks like a few really big, specific technology, technology and economic opportunities paying off, then winning looks like scaling those. If it looks like having an overall market that moves in the direction of net zero, then that's the objective that you want to aim towards. And if it looks like both, then you need policies and investor certainty and clarity that does both. 
Um, but I think one of the big challenges we run into in Canada is that politically, um, I think we, we, we like the idea of winning, but winning often involves achieving a certain outcome over others. And oftentimes it involves making some hard choices about what it is that we don't intend to do. And in order to do that, we really have to outline what it is that we do want to do, which also involves saying largely what we're not interested in pursuing as well. So yeah, that I think is a, a political challenge largely, but it's an important one to move past. Fabulous. Alicia, over to you. Yeah, I'll just re-up the one thing that's kind of been um, brought up in passing a little bit, which is that I think we need much, much, much more collaboration provincially and federally and with industry. So I think that is one big piece of the puzzle we didn't get to talk too much about today, but is really important to get right. Fantastic. And now traffic on the ones with Kevin. Um, I Yeah, I'd reiterate, what does winning look like? I'll build upon um, Larry Fink's and Bill Gates's opportunity that, you know, if the energy transition is this $180 trillion opportunity, the next 10 unicorns, the next 10 Teslas and Googles and Amazons are going to be energy transition carbon technology companies. Mm -hmm. How many of those are going to be headquartered in Canada? That's what winning looks like. That is a great question. Thank you all so much. I have had a great time listening to three brilliant minds today. Thank you all for attending. It, this has been just fabulous. Uh, please go to the Canada West Foundation's website for uh, more events that are going to be coming up. Thank you again to the Energy Futures Lab and particularly to Karen Perla for putting this all together. And if you want to know more about future fit hydrocarbons or read the report of the Energy Futures Policy Collaborative, please go to the EFL website and you'll find it there. Thanks so much and goodbye everyone.